good singing like that. If you can't preach, you can't preach. We're talking about maturing in Christ. And uh, we're in Hebrews chapter 5, the last part of Hebrews 5 and the first part of Hebrews 6. And uh, I don't have a coat on today, as many of you have probably noticed. I hope all of you have. And uh, I have a funny story to tell you. It happened a few years back in the office. Uh, by, by the way, I, I don't dress my... I mean, I, I put my clothes on, but I don't pick my clothes out, okay? Sandy always picks my clothes out. So that's, uh, uh, that's why everything matches. But a few years ago, I walked into Kelly's office, and uh, <clears throat> they had their first of three children that they had been taking care of. And uh, Andrea was her name, and Andrea was about 12. And she looked at me, as on a Wednesday night, and she said, You look just like a Ken doll, only fatter. <laughs> so uh, there's always something to keep you humble, amen. <laughs> Bill and Ted were hunting in the woods when they got lost. And Bill said, You know, I have heard that if you shoot three shots into the air, that if there's anyone in hearing distance, they will come to your aid. So, shot three times in the air. They waited. Nothing happened. So Ted said, well, I'll shoot three times in the air. So Ted shot three times in the air. They waited. Nothing happened. So Bill looked at Ted and he said, boy, I hope it works this time. We're down to our last three arrows. <laughs> That's what I call ignorance. Hebrews is written to some Christians who were not maturing. They were showing their spiritual immaturity and their ignorance. And the writer tells them, you need to grow up, you need to mature. So last week I gave you a couple of pop quizzes, going to give you another one today. All right, here it is, five questions and then a bonus question. And uh, the first question that I want to ask you is, and don't, don't holler it out. Put it in here or put it on a piece of paper or whatever you want to do. But uh, who said, am I my brother's keeper? Number two, who said or who came first, Moses or Noah? Number three, name the two sons of Abraham. Number four. Name the first king of Israel. And a simple one. Name the river that Jesus was baptized in. And now the bonus question. Yes or no, true or false. Is it in the Old Testament or the New Testament? This phrase, God helps those who help themselves. How many did you get right? Well... Who said, am I my brother's keeper? Cain. Good. Who came first, Moses or Noah? Good. Name the two sons of Abraham. Isaac and Ishmael. Okay. Name the first king of Israel. Good. Name the river that Jesus was baptized in. Bonus question. Does God help those who help themselves in the Old Testament and the New Testament? Neither. You remember, don't you? Amen. I applaud you. Remember I preached that series? No, that's not in the Bible. That was one of those. How many of you got everyone right? Be, not, be honest. How many got everyone right? How many, got, how many only missed one? How many missed two? How many missed three? Four? A lot of you are lying. How many of you have missed everything? <laughs> All right. Yay, we have a few honest people. Thank you. Well, we are to mature. So stand with me as we back up. Because we're really in chapter 6, but any time you come to a verse that starts with the word, therefore, you need to go back and see what it's there for. So we go back to chapter 5 to pick up in verse number 12, and then we'll read down to verse number 3 in chapter 6. The writer says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again 
the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the discussions of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, notice it's plural, I'll explain that, of the laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment, and this we will do if God permits. Father, help us to grow and help us to desire to grow. Take the word and implant it in our minds and our hearts that we might not sin against you and that we might come to a place of deeper faith and trust. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We are to go on to maturity. We are to develop. We are to grow. And the writer says, these are elementary teachings that I've given you. And there are six of those. There's two... There, there's three, actually, uh, couplets of two, and it teaches us some very important principles. The most famous detective of all time is probably Sherlock Holmes. I mean, there's more that has been uh, written about him and more movies about Sherlock Holmes, but he had a sidekick. Do you remember his sidekick? Dr. Watson, that's right. And uh, they had, would have this exchange, and they would... They would, they would solve a crime, and they would work together to do that. And how many of you have heard the phrase, elementary, my dear Watson? Probably everyone in this room has. But I want you to know something. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who authored Sherlock Holmes, never uttered that phrase in any of his books elementary my dear Watson it was never said and he wrote 29 short stories and four novels that Sherlock Holmes appeared in so where do we get that phrase elementary my dear Watson like most things in popular culture we got it from Hollywood some script writer put that in there and we say it today so I am going to borrow from a literary misquote as I talk about these six doctrinal truths and I will say this it is elementary my dear friends now let's go ahead and look into this and the first one is in verse number two as we are growing in Christ our relationship with God our relationship with God is starts out with repentance from dead works and faith in God. And that's in verse 2. So this is the first of the doctrinal twin towers of truth that we're going to get. You would have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And these are baby steps. Repentance and faith. So we, we repent of our sins and we turn to Christ. The word repent means to do an about face. It would be as though you had a column of soldiers marching. And many of you have been in the military, so you know what I'm talking about. They'd put us in columns, we'd march, and they'd, they'd have us halt, then they'd say about face. You would about face and you'd go the opposite direction. That's what repentance is. It is turning from where you were going and going to where you ought to be. It is a change of the mind that leads to a change in behavior. So if you have repented and come to faith in Christ, then you have made that change. And that's how true repentance works. It is an about face. It is a 180 degree change. I was going this way and now I am going back this way because God has called me to do that very thing. Now, if you were to ask the average person in North Arkansas this question, just go out on the street and say, what does it take to go to heaven? And most people will answer, well, you need to be good and you need to do good. But I'm going to tell you, you can't be good and do good and go to heaven. That's not how it operates. You have to have repentance, and there has to be faith. So you don't do good, and, and you don't act good. That doesn't get you to heaven. Well, <clears throat> many people, unfortunately, 
think that God has this set of scales. And on this set of scales, if you have done more good deeds than bad deeds, then you get to go to heaven. But if you've done more bad deeds than good deeds, then you end up going to hell. But I want you to know that is not true at all. In fact, if you... All right, guess what? If you actually believe that, your faith aligns more with Islam than it does Christianity. If that's what you believe. You say, are you sure, John? Absolutely, I'm sure. Uh, uh, the Koran says this in Surah 2147. We will set up scales of justice for the day of judgment so that not a soul will be dealt with unjustly. That comes from the Koran. The book of Islam. Secondly, in Surah chapter 101, verses 6 through 9, As for him whose scales are heavy with good deeds, they will live in paradise. But he whose balance of good deeds will be found a light, will have his home in hell. Now, if you embrace, embrace that doctrine of a works-based salvation, then you align with Islam and not Christianity. So if that's where you've been at, you are all wrong. And you need to come and recognize that you need to repent of your sins, your dead works, and then you need to turn to God and say, Lord, here I am. Do not embrace that. I mean, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 tells us, if we want to, if we want to compare and contrast, it says, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of works, lest any man should boast. And, and so we come to Christ by our faith but we have to repent and then we turn to Christ now the second side of this repentance is faith and they go hand in hand and 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 it's uh, it's like two sides of the of, the, of a, the same coin you can't have one without the other and, and they're not two separate acts so people think well I repented and then I had faith no you repented because you had faith and you had faith because you repented I mean, you, they, they go hand in hand. They, they, they embrace one another. They are, they are like one simultaneous act. Now listen, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says these words, that without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now watch what James says in chapter 2, verse 9. You believe there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So guess what? It, you, you say, oh, I believe in God. It's not enough. Have you repented of your sins? You say, a lot of people say, oh, I believe in God. And because I believe in God, I'm going to go to heaven. No, no. That's not how it works. And, and these are elementary principles, but unfortunately so many people are still hung up on these elementary principles and they're not growing and they're not moving forward. And, and let's just do a little, how many of you, when you came in here today, you just sat down? You didn't think, well, that pew held me or well, those jump seats hold me. What did you do? You just sat down. Why? You made a faith assessment that quick and you sat you see, we make a faith assessment with Christ. We, we, we believe. We repent. We have faith in God. And as we do that, that simultaneous act, that's what brings us into a relationship with God. Uh, some of you that are older will remember this song, but the younger people, you will not, but it's a good song. Frank Sinatra sang this. He said, uh, Love and marriage. Love and marriage go together like a horse and carriage. This I tell you, brother, you can't have one without the other. It's the same with repentance and faith. You can't have one without the other. I mean, they make, they make the whole. And, and, and that's how we come to God. It's repentance and faith. How do we get saved? How do we come into a relationship with Christ? Elementary, my dear friends. Repentance from sin and faith in God. The second set of couplets that I want to share with you is this. Now, remember, these are only elementary, so we're going to go further than this. It's our responsibility within the church. And our responsibility within the church, guess what? It's baptism and laying on of hands. And that's what he's talking about here. But did you notice what he said? He said baptisms in our text, plural, not singular, not one baptism, but there are multiple baptisms. Now, you say the multiple baptisms, what are you talking about? Well, remember I told you the book of Hebrews was written primarily to Jewish believers who had come out of Judaism and were now 
now had their faith in Christ. And as they came out of Judaism, what they did in Judaism, they had a lot of ritual washings, a lot of baptisms. They would actually walk down into a pool and they would immerse themselves before they would read the Word of God. And they had all of these other ritual washings that Jesus scolds them for and... uh, That was one thing. John the Baptist came preaching a repentance for the nation of Israel. He said, you need to repent as a nation. You've been far from God. First prophet in 400 years. And they were to be baptized to show that they were repenting of their past sins. Then there's Christian baptism. We come and we identify with Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We, we, we recognize the fact that He died for us. Then there's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There's a baptism into the church by the Holy Spirit. So there's all of these different baptisms that we read about. That's why He said it's plural. And some people get caught up and think, well, there's only one kind of baptism. No, there's not. There are many baptisms and we need to understand that. Remember when Peter preached at Pentecost? I'll try to be a little calmer. Maybe that'll settle that down Um, when Peter preached at Pentecost you remember in Acts chapter 2 verse 38 remember what he said he said repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins remember 3,000 people gave their life to Christ for 2,000 years listen for 2,000 years water baptism has been a part of our profession of faith in Jesus Christ all new believers They profess their faith, and they want to be baptized. Why? Why do you want to be baptized? Because you're identifying with Jesus Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection to newness of life. So, guess what? When we are being baptized, you know what we're saying? Jesus is my Lord. So how do you become a member of the New Testament church? It's elementary, my dear friends. Repentance, faith, and baptism. Pretty simple, isn't it? Well... The second uh, twin tower here, or couplet, is not baptism, but it's the laying on of hands. And uh, also in the laying on of hands, there are a lot of ways that they laid hands on one another. In the Old Testament, it, they laid hands on the scapegoat. It was a transference of sins of the nation of Israel. Then they would send that animal out into the wilderness not to come back again. And then also, a father would lay his hands on his sons to bless them. And even there was a blessing where the father would lay his hand underneath the right thigh of the child. And uh, then also to be set apart for a spiritual office, they, they would lay hands on one another. Now, think about it in the New Testament here, though. I mean, you have all of these apostles and some of these disciples that have been with Jesus and Jesus had touched them. Imagine how it felt to touch someone who had touched the hand of Jesus. Don't you know that was remarkable? That they were able to do that, and and, and that that was exciting for them. And that's why in the New Testament church, why you have a laying on of hands. Remember, Jesus would touch people that were sick often with his hands. There there are 5 million touch receptors in the human body, 3 million are in the hands, and touch is something very special. When I go to the hospital, the nursing home to visit with someone, I always pray with them and I always touch them. I'll hold their hand or I'll put my hand on their shoulder and pray for them because there's something that is powerful about the laying on of hands it's just touch it's 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 being consoled it's being loved and you think about the early church when they elected the first deacons you know what the apostles did they laid hands on them they laid hands on them Think about the first missionaries, Paul and Barnabas. They laid hands on them. Remember Paul told Timothy, don't lay hands on anyone too too soon. But if they're given the gift of ministry, lay hands on them by the elders of the church. Now, there's nothing magical about laying on of hands. It is just a physical way to let others know that we're praying for them and they know that we're part of them. So, the twin doctrines of baptism and laying on of hands, it is elementary, my dear friend. Third thing that's elementary in our text is this, and that's our readiness for the future. And it's talking about the resurrection from the dead and eternal judgment. And these... uh, are important doctrines. 
their future doctrines, the resurrection of the dead, the eternal judgment that, that the writer of Hebrews is talking about here. They were central themes in the early church, and, and everyone knew about these, and those doctrines were preached over and over again. And now the writer's saying, listen, you need to move past that. Now, Paul wrote to encourage the church in Corinth, and he said these words in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and following. He said, I'm trying. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. That is an incredible truth. We will be resurrected. The final truth has to do with eternal judgment. And the Bible teaches there are two final judgments. Uh, there is the judgment of the beam of seed of Christ. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you know him, you've been forgiven, and you've had faith, and you've had repentance, guess what? You're a child of God. And as a child of God, you will be at the beam of seed of Christ. You say, what's the beam of seed of Christ? That's where you go to be rewarded for your good. It is not a judgment of condemnation. It's a judgment of commendation. For what you've done, you'll be commended for. But then there's a second judgment. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, you'll be at the second judgment. It's called the great white throne judgment. And you will be judged based upon your unbelief. Based that you didn't Take the blood of Jesus Christ and let it be applied to your life that you might find forgiveness for your sins. And your name will not be written in the Lamb's book of life. You can read about it in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. But if you end up there, you're in foul shape. You are lost for all eternity. So how do you get your name in the Lamb's book of life? Well, it's elementary, my dear friend, by repentance and faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work. It is elementary, my dear friend. We often, uh, we often do what in our sermons, but don't give a how. So I'm going to give you a how to go along with a what. How to grow. It's on the back of your bulletin. First is get alone with God. Get alone with God. In Mark chapter 1 verse 35, in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary, solitary place, and there he prayed. It's talking about our Lord. He, he got up, and he had the opportunity to spend time with the Heavenly Father. Now, I want you to know something. Time alone with God is never time wasted. Never. Now, our time with the Lord should not just be a monologue, us praying. We should also take time to listen. Lord, what do you want me to know? What do you want me to do? But I want to tell you how to pray real quick with four letters, okay? It's Acts, A-C-T-S. Get along with God and adore Him. If you really love somebody, you tell them, right? Adore God. C, confess all known sin. T, thank Him for everything in your life. Because every good gift comes down from the Father of lights. And S, supplication. Pray for others, not just yourself. Spend a little time with God alone in prayer. That time was not wasted. Secondly, we need to read the Word of God. This passage out of Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, I, I love this passage. The, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth for you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Did you notice the dens when they come? 
after you do this. You meditate on the Word of God. Get alone and meditate on it. Now you say, I don't know, I don't even know what books to read. Take a month and read through the book of Philippians or James or John. Take a short book and, and keep reading it. Spend the entire month just reading it over and over and over and over and over again. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to be amazed what you'll learn in that month that you're doing that. You'll be amazed how much more you know about the Lord and His Word. Well, let's go to the next. G-R and then O is offer encouragement to others. This means fellowship. This means you have to get together with believers. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 say, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together, but exhorting others exhorting one another and so much more as you see that day approaching we need fellowship people say you know what i don't need to belong to the local church i don't need to be in the local church then you haven't read your bible we need one another we encourage one another we come together as a as a group to offer that encouragement to others and be encouraged by them and the last letter of that grow g-r-o-w is witness to others about jesus now a lot of people they say well how do i do that i i mean i don't know all this stuff i don't know how to do all these things well let me tell you something it's it's not a particular formula i've got to know how to do this 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 and this tell them what god's done for you in your life tell them how he changed you just tell people, you don't have to have evangelism explosion or friendship evangelism or any of these other CWT or any of these other things. You tell someone the best testimony that you have is your faith and how you came to faith in Christ and you share that with them and you let them know you too can have the same faith. In Acts chapter 4, Verse 33, with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. You know, it's not a sales pitch when you talk to somebody about Jesus. Some people think, well, it's just sales. No, it, it's not a sales pitch. Guess what? If you've ever been in a court of law, and I've never had to be a witness in a court of law, thankfully, and I have never been on trial in a court of law, thankfully, but I have been in a number of courts of law. And they ask a witness basically three questions. Did you see? What did you hear? What did you experience? Those are the three things that they'll ask a witness. Now, think with me for just a moment. If you knew the cure for cancer, and there are multiple forms of cancer. It's many diseases. But if you had the cure to cancer, and you refuse to share it with the world, that would be a crime against humanity. Do you agree? We have the cure for sin. And often we refuse to share the cure with mankind, and I want you to know something, that is a crime against humanity. Now, how do you grow? Get alone with God. Pray, 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 pray. Read His Word. Start with a small book. Read it for a month in a row. Offer encouragement to one another. And then witness for Jesus. Grow. G-R-O-W. Now, Philippians 1.6 says being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So let me explain it like this. Maturing in the Christian life is like this. How many of you have ever ridden a bike? I mean, just play along, be on. Come on. If you've ever ridden a bike, put your hand in the air. Thank you. Did you ever wreck your bike, fall over? Thank you. More honest there. Apparently more have fallen over than ever ridden the bike. <laughs> but listen, how do you keep going? You keep pedaling. You keep pedaling. And when you keep pedaling, you keep moving forward. You stop pedaling. Guess what? Eventually you're going to 
fall over. And unfortunately, so many people in the Christian life have stopped pedaling. They've fallen over. They're not growing. So how do you mature? Well, you do those four things, you G-R-O-W. How can you tell if you're maturing? I'm going to tell you. Are you ready? You will be more like Jesus. How do you, now, what do you mean, John? The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, against such there is no law. I, was, I opened a door. But I was always taught you open a door for a lady. And I, I try to do that. I try to do it whether it's in the car or the door. When we go home, Sandy and I, I will hold the doors for her. Still do it. It was real cold, and I was out in Little Rock one day, and, and I was rushing to get into this place to eat. I had been at the hospital, and, and uh, there were some ladies coming out. So I pulled the door open and held it, and, and it was too I really wanted to be inside, but I knew this was the right, right thing to do. And one of the ladies, as soon as she walked out the door, she goes, Jesus, it's cold. And I said, well, I appreciate the compliment, but my name's John. <laughs> but the point is, Come as we sing. Don't wait on anybody else. You come. They're going to start singing in just a moment, I promise you. Come to Jesus. Would you come? You need to come? Be born again in the family of God? Would you come today? You need to join the assembly? Come today. Need to be baptized? You've not been baptized? Come today. Don't wait. It's time to grow. have you to do today do it do it quickly
just going to play softly for just a moment. Play softly for just a moment. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads quickly. We're almost done. We're going to go. Let me just ask a question, and you be honest with me. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ and repented of your sins? Have you done that? Just, just raise your hand. Just raise it and keep it up. Raise it and keep it up. Okay, you can put them down. You're thinking about giving your life to Jesus Christ. You just want me to pray for you. Would you raise your hand? I won't embarrass you, but I will pray for you. Just raise your hand up. Amen, amen, amen. Others? Anybody else out there? I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. You're here and you're considering joining the this local assembly. You just want me to pray for you. Would you raise your hand? Amen. 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 I'm going to pray for you guys right now. Father in heaven, I just pray. I pray for those who need to come to Christ that are really considering giving their heart to Jesus. Father, I pray they would do it soon. Maybe even this day. I pray for those who raised their hand, Lord, that said, I'm not certain. I need to be fitted my life to and Father, I pray that they would do that very soon. I pray for those who also said they're considering joining this local body. God, I pray that they would do that soon. and You would just give them the confidence and the faith. And Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just help each of us to grow, to mature, to be the person that you want us to be. I thank you, Lord, because your grace is sufficient. So Father, during this next verse, we're going to sing, If any that raise their hand need to come, Lord, just give them the courage to do so. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. One verse. You come if you need to. Let me at the throne of mercy find the sweet Come, come quick. All right. Listen, thank you for your presence. I apologize for the dreadful headset that I have been wearing today, and we will resolve that issue this week. Uh, I'm going to ask Don to come on up here. We, we can get that in just a minute, Don. Don, you want to come on up here? This is my good friend, Don Sanders. And Don has uh, been attending, become a member at Viola. He wants to become a member at Salem First. How do we hear that? Yeah. Amen. All right, Don, I'm going to ask you to go. Sandy will lead you. And, and I'm going to ask your precious wife to meet you back there right now. Thank you for being here. Guess who's going to preach tonight? Garrett Bricky. And if you've not heard Garrett, you've missed a blessing. Amen. So come back tonight. And Garrett's going to preach. All right. Thank you for your presence today. Uh, Dave Thomas is going to dismiss us in prayer. If anybody here needs to visit with me after church concerning any of those things I, I prayed about and asked you about, I will be at the front door, and I will take as much time as you need. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the words that Brother John has uh, preached today. Father, we know that those words were given from you. Father, we do just pray that we would grow, Father, and mature in your word, and that uh, we would just become the Christian that you would want us to be, Father, and that we would go out and we would witness and, and seek those that's yet to find you, Father, and just uh, bring them to you, Lord. We love and praise you, Father, for all that you provide. Forgive us, Father, of our failures. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you.
Jesus whispers sweet.